We're in a series called Noel. Noel means to be born. And we have already looked at how born is the king. Last week we looked at victorious is the king. And today we're going to look at adored is the king. If I were to sit down with um, all of you individually and I could ask you the question, which one of the, uh, the people in the Bible do you most relate with or do you most want to pattern or model your life after, um, I'm sure there'd be a wide range of answers. Um, I'm sure I would hear some Davids. You know, you want to model your life after King David, a man after God's own heart. Um, I'm sure I would hear some Esthers um, or some uh, Peter's or Paul or Silas or Timothy or John, right? The one whom Jesus loved or Ruth um, or King Solomon, right? There's just an ample number of people throughout the Bible that we uh, either connect with or would desire to live more like. Um, I would assume, though, that for most people in the room, you would not pick the wise men. Uh, the wise men are not known as uh, these people of, of great faith. They don't kind of surface um, to our thoughts when we think about people um, who really honored God with their, with their lives. In fact, in, in um, Hebrews chapter 11, it gives us the hall of faith chapter. Um, the wise men are not listed among uh, the great people of faith. But what we're going to discover today is we kind of dive a little bit deeper into Matthew chapter 2 is uh, these men um, would be great for us to, to emulate. Um, in fact, let's kind of read their story. We're briefly introduced to them, and just as quickly as they come, they quickly go, and we don't hear of them um, anymore. But here's what God's Word says. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod. If you're curious about King Herod, did a whole message on that last week. Go check it out. Um, wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who's been born king of the Jews? For we saw, notice past tense, for we saw his star at its rising and have come to worship him. Evidently, the GPS system for the wise men has failed at this point. They had been following and chasing this star. And I don't know if perhaps God has just blinded their vision to it. Maybe it's a cloudy day, but there's something that is eluding their grasp for this particular moment. When King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. So he assembled all the chief priests, the scribes, and the people asked him, um, he, uh, the scribes of the people, and asked them where the Christ would be born. The Messiah is that word. Um, in Bethlehem of Judea, they told him, because this is what was written by the prophet. Let me, let me translate that. Here's what they're saying. This is what God says. Where is he to be born? And they're responding, this is what God says, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, because out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Can we pause and just give thanks that God chooses the least? Anyone grateful for that? He chooses the least. He chooses the lowly. He chooses the humble at heart. Then Herod secretly summoned the wise men and asked them the exact time the star appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. When you find him, report back to me so that I too can go and adore him, so that I too can go and worship him. Again, uh, we talked about that last week. Um, after hearing of the king, they went on their way, and there it was. What, what was? The star. The star that they had seen, past tense, at its rising, it led them until it came and stopped above the place where the child was, not, not a baby at this point. Uh, Jesus is probably not quite two years old yet. Um, when they saw the star, they were overwhelmed with joy. Entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and falling to their knees, they adored him. They worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and being warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their own country by another 
route or, or route, okay, for some people in the room. Um, they went home a different way. Um, who are these wise men? There are a lot of uh, confusion and questions around the wise men. Were they magi, magicians? Were they astrologers? Were they kings? Isn't there a song that says we three kings? I want to kind of demystify for you and explain who the magi exactly were. Now, in the Greek, it's the word uh, magos. It's where we derive our English word magician, okay? But the magi were not like walking around doing card tricks, okay? They weren't saying, hey, pick a card, any card. Um, they, you know, weren't pulling rabbits out of, out of hats. That wasn't their role. Um, magi served in the king's courtroom, okay? They served the king. They uh, appointed kings. They affirmed kings. They were a council to the kings. In fact, if we go 600 years before the birth of, of Christ, before this passage that we just read, uh, we go to the time of Daniel, the same Daniel who uh, slept all night with a, in a den of hungry lions and lived to tell about it, that Daniel. Um, he was there and uh, living under King Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, Daniel chapter 2, and he's bothered by it and he wants it to be interpreted. He's seeking understanding. And so who does he call? He calls the Magi. He calls the seers. He calls his trusted advisors. Like, like in America, when, when we need to get something done and we need to know that it's going to get done, there's like a SEAL team, okay? SEAL Team 6 kind of go in and, and, and do what needs to be done. Um, the Magi were, were kind of like the intellectual SEAL Team 6. They were the advisors. They were the council they, they spoke, and they were very knowledgeable, okay? They were very, very uh, well studied, very well educated. They studied the stars, and so we sometimes call them astrologers. And so let me summarize it like this. Here, everyone's wondering, okay, well, who are they? Here, here's who they are. They were wise men. That's who they were, right? So the next time around Christmas, if someone's like, who are the Magi and the King? You say, hey, I know. They were wise men. Now, I love what Matthew does for us. Matthew's brilliant, okay? And he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and so we have the Spirit to teach us, to show us, to guide us. Matthew chapter uh, 2, verse 1, it says, they, the wise men, arrived in Jerusalem. In verse 12, the last verse we read, it says they returned to their home, okay? So they arrived, and they returned but don't you know, there was a lot that happened between the arrived and the returned. There was a lot that happened. In fact, I don't think we're going out on a limb to say this, but I, I truly believe that these wise men were transformed between the arrived and the returned. It says that they returned by a different way. But I believe they're not just returning by a different way. They are returning home different people. Why? This is the question we need to ask. Like, why? Like, what was it that brought about this, not a, not a tweak, okay, but a radical change, a radical transformation in their lives? So let's go ahead and give the church answer. Okay, everyone's thinking the church answer. Let's put that on the table. The church answer is Jesus. You were thinking it, weren't you? Someone, hey, how, why were they changed and how were they changed? We might just kind of throw that out there, right? Well, they met Jesus, right? They encountered him. They experienced him. But can I tell you something that wasn't enough? Now, some of you just squirmed a little bit. You're like, we need to get this guy off the stage. He just said that Jesus wasn't enough. Bear with me. Listen, because there are people that we read about in the New Testament who encountered Jesus and weren't changed. And so, yes, Jesus is a thousand percent enough to bring about transformation in your life, in my life, in the deepest sinner's life. He's more than enough. But we also have to see that there is a, uh, there, there is a heart issue at work on the other end. Remember the rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and he wants to know the way to eternal life in heaven? And Jesus responds to him and he goes back. He returns the same way he arrived. No change. 
no transformation. So there's something else at work here. And I would assume that in a, an audience like this, there, there's some of you, you have encountered Jesus, and there was a radical change in your life. I love the testimony of, of one person in our church. They said they, they started seeking after God. They thought, well, I might as well open the Bible and read it. They started reading the Bible, and one by one, they fell under conviction of things in their life. And so they just quit. Just like God's word says it, and so I'm not doing that anymore. And it was a radical shift simply because they encountered the Christ through the word of God. For others of you, maybe you're that person like on testimony night um, in small group or in church, and you're like, I don't really have a testimony. I've just always grown up in church and raised in church and drugged to church, and I've always loved God, and there's no radical change. Listen, there's been radical change in your life. You may not can see it like the light switch, but you can look back in your life and know that 10 years ago, you're not the same person you are today than you were then. And it may not be that radical moment, but the weeks have added up into months and the months have added up into years. And you can look back and see, look, I am not the same person. I don't know what's happened, but I know this. I was blind, but now I see. And then for others, you've encountered Christ. and You've come to church. You've heard him preached and proclaimed. You've, you've heard people sing songs to him, but there's been no change. You, you, have, you have left the same as you have arrived. So what was different? What's unique here? I think there's three things, all right? Um, it's a good old Sunday sermon, right? You got three points. Uh, number one, there is diligent seeking. They didn't just encounter Jesus. You, you have to, before they encountered him, there was diligent seeking. Let's go back to verse 1. Uh, Matthew records, they arrived in Jerusalem. Let's pause there. Let's state the obvious. You don't just arrive places, do you? You don't accidentally arrive. You purposefully pursue let me say that again. You don't accidentally arrive. You purposefully pursue places. It's not like they were just wandering around and just showed up in Jerusalem. No, they are diligently seeking. And if you question this, and let me encourage you this afternoon, drop down to the Austin airport as you're coming in. You can take the arrivals or you can take departures. Go to the arrivals and spend some time with a notebook, uh, notebook and pen and interview the people who are stepping off the plane and ask them, why are you here? You know what you're going to hear? Different stories, but singular purpose. Some are going to say, I'm, I'm here visiting family on Christmas. Some are saying, I'm, I'm taking a, a vacation. Some of you are saying, I'm, I'm here, I have business in the Austin area this week. Some are going to say, um, I'm thinking about moving to Austin. I'm coming to scope things out. And you're going to tell them about Antioch, Georgetown, okay? Um, but there's a lot of different reasons, but those reasons allude to purpose. You're not going to meet a single person who says, you know what? I just woke up this morning in my house, and I accidentally packed my bags. And then I was going on the internet and I accidentally purchased a plane ticket. And I accidentally got in my car and drove to the airport. And I accidentally took off my belt and my shoes and I stood like this for a few seconds. <laughs> and I accidentally walked to gate 12 and they accidentally let me on. And I accidentally took my seat and I accidentally arrived. No, 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 no. You don't accidentally arrive anywhere. You purposely pursue so why would we think when it comes to proximity to Christ, why would we think we'll accidentally arrive? No, you purposefully pursue proximity to the Son of God. You purposefully draw near. And the promise that we have from God's Word is you draw near to God. What does He do? He draws near to you. And so Matthew just puts it out there for us. Look, they arrived in Jerusalem. By the way, this is a 900 mile journey from my house to Atlanta, Georgia, 904 miles. What if I said to you today, let's take a trip. We're going to load up the camels. Some of you are like, we get the weir, I'm done. Like, send me back home. Um, it is too long. Listen, the further the distance, the greater the commitment. 
And so we know that there is great commitment because this distance between Persia and the east where these magi would have been located to Jerusalem, this is several months of diligent seeking. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, God rewards those who attend church 52 weeks a year. This is the Andy translation, okay, no. Um, God rewards those who seek Him. We find Him in the seeking. If you seek, you will find. And these wise men demonstrate for us what it looks like to diligently, fervently, in a committed way, seek proximity to the Messiah. And we would do well to emulate that pattern. And it's through that seeking that we begin to see our lives transformed because it puts us close to the very Son of God. All right, so number one, um, diligent seeking. Number two, courageous faith. Courageous faith. I want you to see the courageous faith of these wise men. Um, I kind of mentioned it in, in the reading. Verse two, we saw his star at its rising. This is what they said to Herod. Um, again, Siri's not working for them at the moment, and so they, they're kind of losing their course, and they're, so they go, to the, they go to the king's castle, right? And they ask the king, where's the king going to be born? Um, we saw it past tense, and then look at verse 9. Uh, well, let me back up. The king asks the priest and the scribes, where is the king to be born? By the way, the, the, the priest and the scribes knew the word of God, and so they said, Bethlehem. But they didn't seek him. They weren't seekers. They were standers. They were over here going, he's over there. The wise men show us what it looks like to seek him. Look, don't, don't be a pointer. Don't be a standard for others and say, yeah, go, go do that. No, we, we follow after him. And so based on the word of God, Bethlehem. Right, so when they said the prophets say, what they're saying is God said so the word of God says Bethlehem. So based on a word of God, what did the wise men do? They started their journey to Bethlehem. Um, it says they went on their way, notice this, and there it was. There what was? The star. The star that they had seen at its rising. So I want, look, I want you to see the order here. They went... And then they saw. Okay, they didn't sit around and say, well, we'll move once, once God shows up. Once God does his part, then I'll do my part. No, what are they? They acted in faith based on the word of God. They took a step in the direction of Bethlehem because that's what the word of God says. And that's when God provided that star again to guide them right to the house where his son dwelled. I love uh, Tony Evans has a, uh, an incredible definition of faith. He's, he says it like this. Faith is acting as if it is so, even when it's not so, because God said so. That's faith. And we see that for these wise men, right? They are acting as if it is so. They are acting as if Messiah is born in Bethlehem, even though in this particular moment they can't see it with their eyes. And because they acted as if it is so, even though it didn't seem so, because God said so, what did God do? God showed up. What a beautiful lesson for us. We often think, and I'm guilty of this as well, God, if you'll do this first, then I'll take a step of faith. God, I'll get out of the boat if you put it right next to the dock. God's, we see it time and time all throughout Scripture. No, you move, and what does God do? God shows up. And God responds to faith. That Hebrews 11 verse we read a second ago, right before that, it says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. You can't walk with God without faith. And listen, the more you walk with him, the more he shows up. And the more he shows up, the more you trust him. And the more you trust him, the more you walk with him. And the more you walk with him, the more he shows up. And the more he shows up, your trust grows. And the more your trust goes, the closer you walk with him. You see the cycle here? But it starts with a courageous faith, acting as if it is so, even when it's not so, because God said 
So let me illustrate it. Um, perhaps Sunday after church, someone has asked you, hey, how was church today? And there are those, there are those Sundays, right? We've all experienced them. We're like, man, church was powerful. And the Holy Spirit was moving. I had chill bumps. The hair was standing up. Like the songs just resonated. I loved it. And the preaching was amazing. <laughs> You've had, like, they come every now and then, okay? And you're just like, you're, you're like, I mean, I just felt the Holy Spirit today. Like, we've, we've all said that. We've all done that. But, but what about the Sundays we don't feel Him? What about the Sundays when the songs don't resonate with our hearts, when the message doesn't resonate with us, and the hair doesn't stand up on the back of our necks, and there's no chill bumps, and someone says, hey, how was service today? How do you respond then? You know how we should respond? This, this is Andy, the, the person talking, okay, not Andy, the preacher. Um, how we should respond is, man, it was powerful today. Because Jesus was exalted and glorified. And no, I, I, didn't, I didn't feel it the entire time, but I know this, where two or three are gathered in his name, his presence is there. And when his presence is there, there is power in there. And even though I didn't walk away with a bunch of feel-good stuff, I'll tell you something, there is people that God was working in their life all around me. And so, yeah, it was a powerful day. That's what it looks like to act as if it is so, even when it doesn't seem so, because God said so. Look, what's going on in your life right now that's requiring courageous faith? If there's nothing we can point to in our life that shows courageous faith, are we really trusting him? Are we really walking with him? Last thing we see is genuine worship. We see diligent seeking. In the seeking, they're transformed. We see courageous faith. In the faith, they're transformed. But then lastly, this is so good, um, we see genuine worship, not fabricated worship, not forced worship, not performance worship, but a genuine heartfelt worship. How do we know? Because we see three things. We've got three things again. All right, number one, joy. There was joy. Remember when they saw the star, what happened? They were overwhelmed with joy. It was in that moment that they knew like they were on the right path that they were about to experience what, what very few people had the opportunity to experience in the course of history, to place themselves at the feet of the child of God. This was incredible, and they were overwhelmed with joy. Joy is not tied to circumstances, that's happiness. This is an inward peace, even if there's chaos around us. They experienced this joy. Real quick, I want to show you um, a verse from Zephaniah. All right, let's go minor prophets for a second. Zephaniah, he is prophesying about the last days. Um, sometimes the Bible calls it the, the, the day of the Lord. This is judgment day. This is the wrath. Um, this is when God begins to um, pour out consequences upon the earth uh, for sin. And so um, here's, here's what Zephaniah says about this judgment that is to come. He says, um, sing for joy, daughter Zion. Shout loudly, Israel. Be glad and celebrate with all your heart. It's kind of funny, huh? Hey, judgment's coming. You should be glad and celebrate and rejoice with all your heart. Now, what reason would they have to rejoice or celebrate with all their heart? Zephaniah says it in the next verse. He says, for the Lord has removed your punishment. That's why. He's removed your punishment. He's turned back your enemy. The king of Israel, the Lord, is among you. Listen, if you have professed faith and trust in Jesus Christ, know this, your punishment has been removed. That ought to stir up an overflowing joy in your life. And this is why this is so important, because worship can't happen outside of joy. Like it starts with joy and out of the overflow of joy and what God has done on our behalf through his son Jesus Christ then we can worship so before the worship we see there was joy number two there's humility they, they, they come in the, the, the star is over this house they come in and they see the child and they see Mary and what do they do Matthew records they fell to their knees let me remind you these are dignified wealthy people who stood in the king's courtroom and yet here they are in front of a child a one and a half year old child and they are humbled listen when it when it comes to worship 
we've got to check our sophistication at the door. There's, we we got to be like David and be, just be willing to get undignified for a minute as we stand before a holy and greatness of God. There's humility. The, the third thing we see um, between joy and, and humility, we see offering. It was out of joy that they were humbled. It was out of the humility that they began to make offering. They presented these gifts, gold, um, frankincense, and myrrh. Um, not practical gifts, okay, for a, a one-year-old baby, um, but supernatural prophetic gifts. Gold fit for a king. Frankincense fit for a god. Frankincense was used as a, as a fragrance and aroma, lifted up his prayers to God. And then myrrh fit for a burial. Can you imagine, like, someone giving you a gift and it's embalming fluid? But they are speaking to the work of this child. He didn't just come to bring some self-help. He, he came to redeem a lost and broken world. And he did that through dying on the cross. So they're speaking to his kingship. They're speaking to his deity. And the gift also speaks to his humanity, that this man will die in our place. But notice, there's a really key phrase. If you highlight in your Bible, I would encourage you to highlight this. Before they presented the gifts, something happened. It says they opened their treasures. See, before you can present a gift to the Lord, you first have to open your treasure. The Bible says where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So they opened up the treasure that was their heart. And they're not just presenting stuff. They are presenting themselves to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Something strange has happened to me every, every now and then. Maybe it's happened to you. Um, we'll be over at some friend's house, and they have little kids, and you know, you like to kind of play with the kids, and engage the kids, make the kids laugh. And um, I've had little children bring me and gift me a dollar. <laughs> to them, it's it's a really big deal, is it not? Like they 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 have some money, you know, in their piggy bank, and they go and they get out a, a few quarters, and they they want to they want to give you something. Um, but here's what's true for probably everybody in the room, a, a dollar really doesn't change our um, monthly habits, you know, too much. Um, it's not like moving the needle on the net worth, okay? Um, but you receive it. Why? Because this, this child simply wants to give it. Listen, we, we can present offerings to God, and, and, and we should. We should give ourselves to Him. But listen, you, you can write the fattest check to God. And it's like a dollar. He's not impressed with the amount. What's he impressed with? What's he desire? It's the heart. I mean, he, he owns it all anyway, okay? You're not adding to his storehouse. I'm not adding to his storehouse. But, but it's a sign of worship. It's a sign that our heart is open to giving to God who has given us so much, the most precious, valuable thing, His own Son, Jesus Christ, in our place. I want to leave you with a question. It's the question that uh, Jesus first asked, first question um, from Christ. There were two disciples following Jesus, not closely, but from a distance. They were originally followers of John, John points them to Jesus. They start to follow Jesus. Jesus turns and he, and he asks them this. What are you seeking? What are you seeking? I want to invite you right now, just even bow your heads and close your, close your eyes. Not because that's special, just, just to get alone with God. And, and, and picture that it's Him today through, through His Spirit and it's, it's Christ asking you this question, what are you, what, are you, what are you seeking? It wasn't the only time he asked this question. He asked others, what is it that you want? What, are you, what do you desire? What are you chasing after? I mean, there are, there are things we chase after that are empty and vain. There's one thing that matters, and that's him. I just want to remind you, you you don't, active, you don't accidentally arrive. 
you purposefully pursue. And I want to I want to pursue him. I want to live a life like the wise men that shows others, and I have diligently sought the Lord that I've lived a life of, of courageous and bold faith, that I've genuinely worshipped. And I'm far from perfect, and I'm not there, but man, I'm, I'm committed to this journey, and I'm inviting you to be committed to this journey as well. As we come together, and as we adore the King.